Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey, bosses. This is Johnny, and welcome to episode 93 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I am in Bankskol, Bulgaria, in my new apartment, and Sam is in Tampa, Florida, in his. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, man. It's been a while since we've gotten back on. We're doing some updates to the site, logo, branding, and a lot of new things in the way for iLab, but it's good to reconnect, and I'm glad you got settled in Bulgaria. Yeah, I just arrived today. I actually just spent the last about a month or so in Greece, and I think we, we missed an entire month. I think we, we recorded a little bit when we were... When, where was I the last time we spoke? You were in Nepal, I believe. Wow. I can't believe we skipped a whole country. <laughs> Normally we're on it, but I spent the last month getting moved in and rooms to go, Bed Bath & Beyond shopping in Tampa. That was an exhausting process. We'll talk about more than that on our Q2 updates. But this week, great new guest, Ed Connard. Big name guest. I mean, I've seen him on some some big TV shows, big uh, – like big financial companies. I mean, he's a big boss. He's a big boss. He's the old founding partner, now retired, previous founding partner at Bain Capital, where he's partners with Mitt Romney. And he's wrote two of my favorite books, The Unintended Consequences, and most recently, The Upside of Inequality, which we're going to dive into a little on this episode. Yeah, and they're both top 10 New York Times bestsellers as well. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely hoping you ask him about the kind of ups and downs of inequality because a lot of people now are especially you know the the middle class you know they feel like they're getting squeezed and that's all we hear on the news all the time is you know the top one percent or the rich are squeezing the middle class out and i want to know what his thoughts are and if that's true or not yeah it's interesting because i actually hear this more from like my parents but not from the standpoint of it's the top 1% that are squeezing us out. It's more like it's government spending and inflation. So I think all the everyone in the middle class feels like they're getting squeezed. I think a lot of people, like say the baby boomers, they're just getting older and they feel like they have less spending money. But I thought this would be a great episode just to dive into more the general economy and the free market and discuss you know general dynamics of of where we're at today and how things have a little bit been through history some some uh, of the similar narratives uh, to the Mark Faber episode that we did a couple month, months back that everybody really enjoyed uh, we talk about investing so much sometimes it's good just to jump into fundamentals and discuss it an economy as a whole yeah definitely because I think I mean for me personally I think the economy is doing great you know I think there's a lot of opportunity there's a lot of high level jobs uh, these stock markets going up you know real estate's high i think it's going great yet at the same time there's so many people who you know feel like it's the end of Days. the us economy or it's everything's going bad so i'm really curious to have an expert on to just talk about it absolutely well let's get ed on and then let's recap afterwards some of the key takeaways i'm looking forward to sharing all right here we go Everybody, welcome back today, and we have a very special guest, the best-selling author of multiple books, including The Upside of Inequality and previous founding partner at Bain Capital, and other, other than Ed Connard. Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's literally a thousand questions that I would love to ask you, and I just really enjoy reading both your books and also watching a lot of your interviews. It just It is a great knowledge base that you have. And I love the message that you're trying to carry. And, you know, I, I talk to a lot of the older generations, talk to my parents all the time. Everyone's always complaining about the squeezing of the middle class of America. And because I'm relatively young, I haven't seen the transition over the course of the last couple of decades. But do you think that inequality and the wealth of the top 1% is part of this equation of the quote unquote squeezing of the middle class? Uh, so I guess I two things. The first is I don't think the success of the most successful workers is what is responsible for the slow growth 
in wages of the middle and working class. Uh, and I do think that the wage growth has slowed down, but I think independent forces are at work uh, between the two. I don't think there's a, been a squeezing in terms of what percent of people are middle class. I don't think there's been as much of a squeezing as the media uh, makes it out to be, although I think that wage growth has slowed down. I think uh, Pew Research says something like uh, there's been an 11-point reduction in the middle class. Seven of those uh, were from people moving up in income, and four of those were from people moving down. But if you looked at the four points moving down, three of those four points were from an influx of low-skilled Hispanic immigrants. So if you really looked at native-born workers, it was seven up and one down. I also hired consultants to, to scour the census database and uh, plot the distribution of incomes for uh, African-American workers, white workers, Hispanic workers, and all workers combined. And I think you say that the shape of the distribution of, of, of wages of income hasn't really changed much at all. It's shifted up slightly. It's become more prosperous. I think if you really dig through the data, you'd find there's been about a 40 to 50 percent increase in middle class wages. If you consider everything, not only the wages, but taxes, uh, non-taxed uh, uh, income like uh, pension benefits or health care benefits, uh, government uh, uh, entitlements like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, if you look at the uh, reduction in the number of workers, really do all of the proper calculations. There's probably been a 40 to 50 percent increase in uh, median wages since 1979. Uh, why don't I think the success of the top uh, 1% is really affecting middle class wages, and I could talk to you about why, what I think is affecting the wages, but you've shifted to this uh, information-based economy. It doesn't require much capital, unlike uh, manufacturing companies of old, like Ford Motor Company, which needed a lot of capital to build factories and inventory and dealerships and such in order to reach economy-wide success. You see companies like Google and Facebook Microsoft can scale to economy-wide success with very little need for uh, capital. And so they don't have to share much of the value that they create with, with other investors. So I think you see this sort of lottery-like effect where more people have tried to join the lottery. Uh, Information-based innovation, even if it's applied outside of Silicon Valley to, say, finance or managing companies, I think has really opened the door for people to be the most productive workers to be more productive. And that's why I think we're seeing uh, more inequality at the very highest end of the wage scale. We mm -hmm. see it a little bit uh, for high skill workers at like the 90, 95th percent, but much, 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 much more muted at those levels than the top 1%. And really what you see is in the top 0.1% which is largely based uh, entrepreneurial success, driven by entrepreneurial success. Mm -hmm. Now, if it was just the top 1% negotiating a greater share, we'd see telltale signs of that, but we see exactly the opposite. We see turnover in the Fortune 500 accelerating. We see turnover in uh, uh, CEO tenures accelerating. We look at the Forbes 400 richest Americans. It's largely composed of self-made uh, entrepreneurs, what, much higher percent than what we have seen in the past. If you look at uh, economies with more equally distributed incomes like Japan or Europe, you would have expected to see uh, U.S. growth uh, slowing down relative to those economies if we were misallocating resources, if our top 1% was simply uh, using their negotiating leverage or were uh, uh, stealing it or using inside information or whatever they might, uh, unproductive ways that they might have uh, captured that instead of actually going out and creating products and value that uh, benefit customers and earning it. We should be growing more slowly. Our uh, productivity growth has actually accelerated uh, relative to those economies. And if you really dig down to the data and look at things like investment, investment by sectors, we look at sectors that are uh, consolidating. One of the arguments on the other side is that uh, profitability has increased and we see sector consolidation. We don't see a slowdown in capital investment in those sectors. In fact, we see rising productivity in consolidating sectors, the exact opposite of what you would expect if people have monopoly power. So it makes a very good story at uh, 30,000 feet, but I think when you mm -hmm. dig, I've tried to dig into the data on many different uh, levels and many different aspects. I don't think it adds up. You know, What's driving slow growth of middle and working class wages? I think two things. And I think uh, advocates of free markets like myself don't like to admit these things, but one is trade. If you look at balanced trade, 
what are we doing? We're selling high-skilled labor, Apple operating systems to the rest of the world. There's a shortage of high-skilled labor in the world, and we are buying cheap, uh, low-skilled Chinese labor because there's an enormous uh, abundance of low-skilled labor in the world. So we're increasing the demand for high-skilled labor, and we're increasing the supply of low-skilled labor. We should expect that to increase uh, inequality, and to a certain extent it probably has. To the extent that trade, uh, and, and I'm not suggesting that, uh, that trade, you know, we can't make for $20, but we can buy for $5 and mm-hmm. remain competitive in the long run. We simply can't be driving around in high-cost cars and, and think, you know, in the long run that's going to work. It's it's not. So I'm not I'm not saying I'm against uh, free trade. I'm simply saying that the benefits are not shared equally. If you just think about lower prices at the cost of lower wages, what you would find is that the uh, the middle uh, class and blue collar worker is uh, suffering about a hundred percent of the pressure on lower wages from trade, and is getting about twenty five percent of the benefits. Fifty five percent of GDP is earned by the top forty percent. Uh, retirees consume about fifteen percent of GDP. The working poor, I mean the non working poor, pardon me, the bottom twenty percent, the non working poor. Um, about five to ten percent of GDP that they, they, they uh, get largely through entitlements. So what's really left for the workers is about twenty-five percent of GDP. So they're spending about uh, four dollars of, of lower wages to get a dollar of benefit. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's like four to one ratio is probably a better way to put it. It's possible that the benefits are are greater than the cost, but no economists really know. Uh, uh, whether that's true or not, and frankly, given the four to one ratio, it's actually a little bit hard to believe. So, so you know, what happens? We tell these workers, "Don't worry, we move a factory to uh, Mexico. The entrepreneurs are coming. They're going to put you back to work. They'll compete with each other. They'll invest capital, increase your productivity, and your wages will be right back to where they were before." But what the worker sees is that the entrepreneurs moved to California. He's outsourced his jobs to. Uh, what little blue collar jobs they're creating are being outsourced to Asia. Meanwhile, the uh, the engineer who stayed behind is designing products, competitive products in factories that employ Mexican workers, not American workers. And so, what you find is that uh, that worker has been left behind because the uh, the uh, high skilled American worker has left the heartland has left manufacturing, has moved to the coastal cities, um, and has largely focused on on, on innovation rather than increasing blue-collar productivity. I can tell you, I, you know, I could rattle on here forever, but I can <laughs> tell you an amazing statistic about the U.S. economy, which is um, the OECD, uh, which is an organization of the most economically developed uh, countries, Europe, uh, the U.S., Japan. Uh, we survey uh, adults, uh, for uh, their aptitude, their cognition. We're basically giving them a, a mm-hmm. academic tests. In America, the top tw- uh, 25% of the workforce scores in the top third on those, on those international tests. 45% of workers score in the bottom third, which means we have one high-skilled worker, high-scoring high worker for every two low-scoring workers. Mm-hmm. In Germany, it's about a third in the bottom, a third in the middle, a third at the top, so they equal the international averages. That means they have one high-scoring worker for every low-scoring worker. So relative to the United States, they have twice as many high-scoring workers per low-scoring worker. Scandinavia has three times as many. Japan has almost five times as many. So we have a relative shortage of high skilled workers. Meanwhile, we've been way more productive at putting those workers to work. They work at companies like Google and Facebook that gave them, give them much more valuable on-the-job training. They work longer hours. They take more entrepreneurial mm-hmm. risks. If you look at, if you look at uh, unicorns, for example, billion-dollar uh, 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 tech startups that haven't gone public yet, we're creating about eight times as many as our counterparts mm-hmm. in, uh, in Europe have so you can see that we're way more productive but the effect of this is that think about what a talented worker can do they probably can do three jobs one is they could work on innovation that grows the economy increases productivity raises wages the second is they could be a doctor or a lawyer which is not to say some of those people aren't are in, aren't innovators they are but they're largely providing high skilled services that keep the economy uh, rolling and lastly they can supervise uh, low skilled workers 
Well, the opportunities, because of the short, just a twofold effect in the United States. One, there's a shortage, and two, there's enormous opportunity in, 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 the, in innovation. And what is that innovation focused on? Well, you know, the most valuable use for your constrained resources is increasing the productivity of your constrained resources. So the talent goes to work writing computer programs that make talented workers more productive and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So what you find is that our most skilled workers are out there working for each other, increasing the productivity of each other while they leave uh, the rest of the workforce behind to fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you see the slowdown in, in, in productivity of the blue collar worker. And when that guy goes to get in line to get a job and he's looking to the same pool of a of high-skilled workers to create a high-paying job for him, he, what does he find? He finds 40 million foreign-born adults and their 20 million native-born adult children all looking to the same pool to create the new innovative jobs that are going to give them, them higher wages. So if you spread those resources over more uh, workers, particularly when you start with a shortage of those workers and a large percentage of them are working for each other, you're going to end up with slow slower productivity growth in your in your blue collar workforce and when you look at the uh, carefully at the numbers what you find is if you look at the digital economy which I'll include finance and mark uh, media and things like that you find a productivity growth that's about four times higher than the rest of the economy if you look at the rest of the economy you also find higher productivity growth in manufacturing and retail, but they're largely growing by shedding workers, not by adding workers. Mm -hmm. So when you really get down to the incremental worker who's being added to a new job, the new blue-collar job, there's probably very slow productivity growth in that job. And I'm, I guess I should have said one more thing is I think what you see in these uh, uh, sort of information-oriented sectors of the economy where we can measure productivity mm -hmm. – it's probably the case that the higher productivity we see in those sectors is generalizable to information workers in all sectors of the economy. Because when you look in those sectors, what you find are uh, heavily skewed towards white collar workers, much higher investment in uh, information technology. And so what you'd also find in a manufacturing company is, yes, they're investing a lot in information technology, but they're largely trying to increase the productivity of their of their high skill workforce where they would bump into shortages because many other companies in the US are are bidding for that talent yeah. and so you know while they're moving their, their production to Mexico they're also investing in computer programmers that are going to increase the productivity of their engineering workforce and so um you probably can generalize what you're finding in these uh information oriented sectors of the economy to the economy more broadly and i think where that leads you is that the productivity of our blue collar workforce is probably growing quite slowly. And in an economy where you have an unconstrained supply of low skilled labor, both from trade uh, and from immigration, uh, you can't expect to see higher wages if you don't, if you can't grow the, uh, uh, if you can't grow the productivity. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the, the data bears it out that for the reasons I've described, for the theory I've laid out, I think it adds credibility to my theory that uh, we're just not focused on increasing the uh, the productivity of that middle and uh, working class worker. Now, Ed, That's I, a uh, long-winded answer to your question. Yeah, no, it's perfect. <laughs> Please, the more you can talk, the better. Uh, certainly, you're the expert. And you know, when it comes to GDP, I I just have an observation when I when I walk around the U.S. now, and I've been outside the U.S. for s last six or eight years. When I walk around now. Information technology is everywhere. It's never been easier to pay or move money around. It seems like the governments continue to spend a lot of money. And you got companies, huge companies, Apple, Google, all these offshore foreign operations. It seems like it's almost impossible for America to fully capture or quantify a GDP figure. Like, I don't even know how they, they do it to begin with, but it seems like it's becoming an increasingly more difficult number to truly capture. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, there, so there's been a lot of work on on the measurability of GDP growth, what we are able to capture, what we do a poor job of capturing. Uh, they've been work's been going on for a long time. There's something uh, called the Boskin Commission from I think the 1980s. Um, Michael Boskin is an economist who's uh, still around today, commenting on productivity, but um, I think people believe that while the amount of 
it's, so um, Michael Boskin estimated that we were underestimating productivity growth by about 1% a year. I think people think that it's greater today than it was then, and it might have been greater than 1%, but that was his unbiased uh, estimate. I think people think that with the amount of information technology today, that 1%, you know, we're probably underestimating it even more. Mm-hmm. I don't think we find low, low pro, we have found low productivity growth since about uh, 2008, 2009. I don't think that economists believe that that is all just miscalculated, uh, the, the overlooked mm-hmm technological uh, improvement. I think the other thing you think if you, if you see also that the people are changing their mind about it is if you look over longer periods of time, people were uh, dis- deflating using the uh, consumer price index. I think people believe that that way uh, overstates uh, real inflation, that it's lower than it appears to be. They started to use the deflators that are used for, to measure GDP which take into account the fact that people substitute to one good for another. And uh, those also find that to, that uh, productivity and GDP growth have been higher than they appear to be through the uh, uh, measured numbers. But I think all those numbers, I haven't incorporated all of that, but in my view that, uh, uh, not just my view, but the commonly accepted view that median wages have grown 50% since uh, the late 1970s incorporates some of those issues into those estimates. And Ed, back on to the middle class, I heard a story recently. It was more of a cautionary tale about inflation. And I'm not sure if it's true, but it went something along the lines of in the 1920s, a typical family or household in the U.S., the man worked and the woman stayed home and they were still able to save money. Then by, let's say, like the 1940s, most that that type of lifestyle with a single income couldn't save money. So by the 60s, the women started going to work, which created a dual income and then more savings. But then by the 1980s, it became difficult to save even with a dual income. And now both men and women go to work typically, but the average family seems to be in debt. Do you think there's any truth to that? And if so, is it, what dynamics do you think are playing into it? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's truth to that. Okay. I think if you go back to the... <laughs> I think if you go back to the 1920s, 1930s, mm-hmm. that uh, the median household in the United States is way richer than they were in the past. And mm-hmm. I'm only going back to like 1980, 1979, and they're 50% richer uh, than they were in the past. I think even if you look on a per hour worked, it gets a little more complicated, but I've looked at it uh, by household, by hour, et cetera. You know, you have to, in the, in the case of by hour, you have to take into account uh, changes in the demographic mix of workers, because if you start going back into the past, what you find is it was largely just uh, uh, white men who are the highest paid demographic. Uh, women tend to earn less. Minorities have tended to earn less, um, et cetera. So if you, but if you, if, anyway, when I try to sort through all that, I think what you find is growth across every demographic except for uh, white males where uh, the wage growth per hour worked has slowed down, hasn't grown much because you've just had a flood of, of other workers, particularly high-skilled women who've mm-hmm. come in and competed uh, with men. And that's resorted men where, you know, if you were not quite as skilled as uh, in the past, you would have perhaps earned more. Today, there's probably a high-skilled woman who is, is, is more logical, higher for that same job. So you're going to tend to sort down in the, in the pool. But I think what you really find is that, um, where you have dual income households, the households are way, you know, well above the median incomes in general. Um, I think you find that Americans, there's been a tremendous demand for consumption, don't forget you've had uh, engineers and scientists designing uh, better and better and better uh, consumption than you had in the past, whether that's uh, you know video games or or uh, great dining experiences or 3D movies or uh, flat screen TVs or computers and everything that they bring us. I think that has motivated. Uh, people around the world and in America, especially in America, to want more consumption. They they haven't worked longer hours. They've worked fewer hours, although relative to the rest of the world, our hours have declined. You'd think if what you were saying was true, our, our, our hours would increase. They've declined. 
uh, over the last uh, 50 years, not as much as the rest of the world, I think what you find is that women have entered the workforce for the most part because they want to work, because they, uh, and, and what you find is that the most skillful women uh, overwhelmingly are the ones who enter the workforce and they're the ones who are least likely to have children. Why? Because there's intrinsic uh, enjoyment value mm -hmm. from working and the ones who are able to capture that, the most skilled women are the ones who flock to the workforce and substituted work for having children. So it sounds good. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't buy it. I think if you look at households today, they're way more, uh, they earn way more money than they did in the past. I think what you will find is this, though, that about 50 to 60 percent of the households spend every dollar that they earn. Um, so they're not going to they're not going to have a lot of savings. They're not going to have a lot of wealth. Um, and if you want to buy a house, so remember, financial markets are way more developed today than they were in the past. So uh, a middle class person can borrow money from the bank and buy a house, which would have been much more difficult in the 19. Uh, 20s mm, yeah. before for that to happen. So you're going to find lots of 30 and 40 year old uh, head of households, households mm -hmm. that have borrowed money to buy a house. They're going to be in debt. They haven't saved a lot of money. They're largely spending everything they consume. I will also tell you this. If you step back and look at the bigger picture, the, the way in the U.S., people don't get rich by saving money. And by saving money, I mean by def by not consuming and putting that uh, their earnings in the bank. Right. What really happens is all the savings, all the investments being done by businesses like Google, Facebook, Intel, Ford Motor Company. And so the households that do have wealth own uh, equity in those companies, those are the co that, that's where the savings and investment is occurring. And so really, if you look at ca the capital gains of households, if you look at the assets owned by households in the United States, you would find that the assets have grown faster than GDP and that debt has grown faster than GDP, but the assets have grown even faster than the debt and the households have gotten richer and richer and richer. Now, it's not very equally distributed. And when you have 50% of the households aren't saving any money at all and are borrowing to buy a house, um, they're not going to share in that part of the growth. Mm -hmm. They only share in it indirectly in, the, in that uh, as the world grows richer, the real estate grows more valuable as well. And uh, so some of that value that's created by business gets transmitted to homeowners, to landlords, to households. Mm -hmm through the increasing value of real estate. But I think if you look at the stock market relative to real estate, you see that stock market's grown faster than real estate has. So if you're not uh, directly invested into equity in the United States, you're on a, on a wealth basis, even though your earnings might be high. Mm -hmm. Now, I also think there's a second, another thing that's gone on, don't forget, and people don't factor this in, but uh, that we, we offer enormous, some people can maybe disagree with my adjective enormous, but uh, Social Security and Medicare mm -hmm. benefits to retirees. So what you would have found in 1920s is that people would have been saving uh, for their retirement, saving a small amount for their retirement and not having uh, you know, the, the, the poorest sector of the, uh, of the population were, were the retirees because they didn't save much money and didn't have much money. Today, if you looked at the net present value of their uh, uh, pension and medical benefits, uh, it's an enormous part of their wealth, even though it's not counted in the numbers. And I think what you'd find is a lot of people, that, that will cause a lot of households to, to consume every dollar that they earn and not save for uh, retirement. So in, in this economy, I think what you find is it's the wealthiest households who have the luxury I won't say the wealthiest, but certainly it's the top 50% that have the luxury of augmenting their Social Security uh, and Med Medicare benefits with, uh, with saving. Right. So I, I, I take a lot of exception to that. Mm -hmm. All right. So and there's a, a lot of discussion in your book about the incentives and the importance of incentive in the economy. And I know taxes are a huge part of that. I'm just curious like how you envision this whole thing playing out, the the last statistic I saw, which I'm not sure how updated it was, was that about 45% of Americans do not pay federal income tax. And one would assume that those 45% are likely voting for higher taxes on the, the majority. But at some point, 
does that, what if that switches? If that, if the, if the majority are not paying federal income tax, is that like an inflection point where there's kind of, there's no return? It'll always be higher taxes on the producers and the, the higher income earners? Um, so there's two questions there. I'll, I'll take your second question mm-hmm. first. We can debate whether we want to answer the first one. But uh, sure, as more and more people, uh, I think the, 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 the so I tend to look at all taxes paid and not just income taxes because you get a more dramatic result if you just uh, look at income taxes. But people are paying payroll taxes and uh, they're paying state and local taxes, property taxes, sales taxes. They're also indirectly paying a lot of corporate taxes because it's not as though the corporation isn't passing those taxes on to its customer, uh, particularly domestic corporations where all the competitors are paying the same tax rate. They can all then pass it on to to their customer. So I think if you – and I, the Congressional Budget Office does a lot of analysis of this. There is some analysis of this, analysis of this in my book. I think if you look at the median household – what you find, and I take the median household, this is non-retired households because the retirees have a different profile. The median household under 65 years is largely paying uh, today for all the government services that they consume. Um, now, that means that they're not paying and contributing at all to their own retirement. They're not contributing to the current retirees. They're not contributing to the entitlement benefits that we're paying the uh, people in the bottom 40%. Uh, just FYI, I allocated military spending by uh, how much people earn. So I, I'm saying you, you, you want a military to protect your assets. Uh, uh, rich people are paying a disproportionate share of the military in that calculation. But, um, but anyway, um, so I think right now you're at, an, at a kind of an equilibrium. I, I think with the, I was opposed, by the way, to the middle class tax cut because I don't, for the very reason you're describing, I don't like the idea of having taxpayers who are getting substantially more government benefits than they're paying in taxes because I do think that will unleash somebody wanting more spending uh, they, because they're not paying for it. Why shouldn't they want? Uh, why shouldn't they want free things? Mm-hmm. One of the things I recommend in the book, I don't think it's practical. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think we could actually engineer would be to say, uh, why don't we we uh, zero everybody's taxes in the middle class, perhaps even make them negative, and then let people pay the real cost of the government services that they want. Mm. They wouldn't want government services. And ultimately, it's not taxes that really drive growth. It's government spending that takes resources from the private sector and, and redistributes them to other parts of the economy, and that increases consumption and reduces investment. And ultimately, that's what uh, that's what uh, slows growth. So what I would really want to do is slow down the amount of government spending relative to GDP mm-hmm. if people were really paying for the full cost of the services that they were getting, regardless of what their tax rate is. I think they'd want a lot less government services. they turn to the private sector to buy uh, the services they want. Right now, you know, I agree with you that we're in this odd situation where you pay for the government services through your taxes, but your taxes are substantially lower than the than the services mm-hmm. that you want. Now, yeah. if I go to your first part of your question, which is to what extent do incentives, if taxes uh, are an incentive that would slow down growth, I think what I would describe it this way, which is there's actually a, a very powerful and important feedback loop that encompasses a lot more than just taxes. So if you uh, uh, work at Google and Facebook, for example, and you get very valuable on-the-job training, you're going to see real opportunities, uh, entrepreneurial opportunities to start companies and such that have a high payoff, a high probability of success. That's logically going to motivate you to take a lot more uh, uh, risk. I think if you find experts who've been uh, trained that way, they're going to coalesce into communities like Silicon Valley or Wall Street or Hollywood or the oil industry or formerly uh, the the automotive industry in Detroit that is going to create experts in these in these areas that you can say, oh, if I want to start a company, I have a finance team that knows how to raise financing. I've got a management team that can motivate and structure the workforce. I've got engineers and scientists here who can develop the technology uh, and such. And you also have investors who uh, are really on the inside. They understand the technology. They know who the people are. They can differentiate between good ideas and bad ideas. They're going to be a lot more willing to take risk. All of those things will combine slowly gradually over decades to produce 
a lot more uh, risk taking because they produce uh, uh, higher expected values, which would be uh, how much you're going to get if you succeed and what's the probability that you're going to succeed. So if you compare a worker in the United States to a guy in, uh, say, Greece, He's not going to sit in a cafe in Greece and come up with the next great internet mm -hmm. idea and find a whole bunch of investors who are willing uh, 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 to finance him. Mm -hmm. It's just unlikely to happen. Un and so he's going to be unlikely to take the risk, not just because he can't find it, but even when he finds an idea, it's not a very good idea. Uh, it doesn't have a very high probability of payoff. He has a hard time organizing the team and getting the, the financing. So in the United States, that's developed since the late 1980s over – you know, a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. So all of that together will uh, accelerate growth. So now if, you, if you're if you Europe and you say, well, why don't we cut our taxes and try to accelerate growth? Well, it's not like you can cut your taxes tomorrow and all of a sudden growth is going to accelerate. It might accelerate very gradually. And then over decades, you're going to accumulate all of the things that are required to increase the payoffs for taking uh, risks, but it's probably the case in information technology. Mm. You can never really even catch up to the United States now that you're 30 years uh, behind. Right. And so the same thing happens, I think, in the United States where we can crank up the tax rates, we can crank up government spending. It'll slow growth down a little bit, almost imperceptibly, and we won't really know 20 years from now what could have been the case if we would have had this gradual compounding that occurs over over long periods of time. But if you really look at the difference today between the United States and Europe and Japan, what you find is 20 years of compounding has had an enormous impact on the difference between our productivity and our GDP and wages. Our median household wages are 15 to 30 percent higher than France, mm -hmm. Germany, and and uh, Japan. That's uh, our median uh, household incomes after taxes is what I Incredible. That's what I mean. Incredible. Ed, as a businessman and an investor yourself, how do you feel about the outlook of this economy, this new Trump economy, and some of the new policies that the administration has gotten into play? So I, I love the corporate tax cuts. I think they're actually going to generate more revenue than they cost. Uh, if you really look carefully and make fair and honest assumptions about about. Uh, what's what's likely to occur and w what has occurred in the past. Um, and the fact that I think it will, uh, a lot of companies keeping a lot of money overseas, which comes back as debt instead of equity, I think has a, a, a real, I think most serious economists who would look at that piece of the tax cut uh, would agree that cutting the corporate tax at 20, 21% or even lower for that matter uh, was valuable. I think, unfortunately, the, 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 to get that piece of it, you have to have a very large middle-class tax cut, which I think does nothing but borrow a whole bunch of money, uh, redistribute it to taxpayers who go out and consume it, largely consume it. They don't really invest it. And so you get increased consumption today at the expense of uh, much more debt that's ultimately got to be paid back either uh, you pay back the debt or you pay interest forever. It's the same thing. The net present value of the interest is the same as paying back the debt. You push that, uh, that the cost of that increased consumption onto uh, future generations. So when I peer into the future, I see some troubling things that I don't like. Uh, you know, baby boomers are going to retire. They're going to eat the U.S. alive. They're not going to take no for an answer. <laughs> and so we're going to have to find a way to – uh, to pay them. I believe that high-skilled immigration is, is the only uh, chance that we have to actually pay them without uh, without damaging our economy. Mm -hmm. I see that we are spending way more money than we're taking in in taxes. That's not sustainable in the long run. It pushes the cost onto future generations when we're already going to push uh, uh, the retirement costs onto, onto future generations. And then I think looming uh, in the future as well is a much more, a much stronger China which we are going to have to, uh, you know, hope uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Right. You know, they, they, they may succeed, they may not succeed, but, um, you know, we have to be prepared to defend ourselves militarily after the baby boomers get done eating us alive. So <laughs> would I be cutting taxes to increase consumption today? No, I absolutely would not. Would I be cutting corporate taxes that I think increase investment and accelerate growth? I absolutely would. I don't think the right measure of taxes 
is, you know, what are we, are we maximizing tax revenues? I think what we are trying to maximize is the welfare of our, of our population. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tremendous amount of hidden benefit in investment that, that we don't see. That's consumer surplus, which is not really captured anywhere in GDP. Consumer surplus being, you know, why would you pay a thousand dollars for your computer if it wasn't worth a lot more than a thousand dollars? That more than a thousand dollar value isn't captured anywhere. And you really want to maximize the value of a consumer surplus, not the amount of taxes. But given that you have all these baby boomers that are about to retire and you're going to be in desperate need of of tax revenues to pay for them, I think we're you know dangerously close to a situation where we do need to maximize tax revenues mm -hmm. and uh, and we have to minimize at the same time I think we have to minimize expenditures if we want to get through this as uh, successfully as we can so I do worry that we that running up big deficits at this time but but I just caveat this by saying you can go to my blog there's a chart there on my uh, blog by the way edwardconnor.com mm -hmm. but we'll show you that these tax cuts and spending increases haven't contributed very much to the deficit problem that we were already facing now, we were already facing a big problem. Would I add a little bit more to it? No, I would try to subtract something from it. Uh, but so I'd say the real problem here is what occurred before these tax uh, uh, cuts and spending increases. We were already heading down a path that, that looks damaging to the United States to me. It looks damaging to future generations. It looks damaging to, uh, I think, to the viability of the free market. And uh, those things worry me. I, I have a 15-year-old daughter. I want to uh, I want to hand her a world that's better uh, than the world I uh, that my parents handed me. Mm. And uh, I uh, I wouldn't run a big deficit uh, as the solution. Makes sense, Mr. Connor. We got to know. I'm sure the listeners would love to hear. Feel free to share anything you you are comfortable with. But we'd love to know a little bit about how you manage your own. Uh, wealth and how you invest your own personal portfolio. Is there any way we could get a sneak peek into your asset allocation or where you invest? Sure. Um, uh, I, I take a pretty sophisticated approach uh, to this. I have a, a, a money management firm that helps me out. I, I look a lot like an endowment, by the way. Yeah. So uh, my <laughs> my strategy looks a lot like what you'd expect to see in a in a pension fund or an endowment. Yeah. So I have a very sophisticated allocation across every asset class, every geography in the world, uh, debt, equity, absolute return, hedge funds, you name it. Uh, I, I don't try to pick uh, investments because I don't have uh, the – the capability to, mm -hmm. I think, uh, pick them any better than the market. Instead, the the people who, uh, the money managers who I hire, really do due diligence on money managers to find people that they think have uh, unique insights mm -hmm. into different aspects of of investing in different uh, parts of the of the market, if you will. Sure. Um, I think if you step back at the big picture, I'm probably uh, seventy percent equity, thirty percent debt. But if you dug into that seventy and that thirty you'd find that uh, uh, I have a lot of private equity, I have venture capital, I have hedge funds, I have uh, long only, tax efficient, uh, all kinds of of exotic different strategies in there. I think there's an argument to be made that you just put it all into index funds and the amount of uh, alpha that you're earning over and above the fees, um, you can't earn enough alpha to cover the fees or you can barely cover the fees. My... Uh, I, I was just looking at it the other day, but I've earned substantially more uh, relative to the market than the fees I've paid. Mm. So up to this point, I've been quite satisfied with my with my approach. But Excellent. I don't I don't field uh, investment ideas and try to scratch my head and see if I can crack the code myself. I I leave that to sophisticated uh, money managers who spend. To 24 hours a day trying to crack sure. the code. Yeah, there's a there's a big uh, discussion on you know using managers, using advisors, and fees. And I think that you know a lot of people starting off, they typically either need an advisor or yes, they can just do something in index funds. But I think once you get to a certain level of success and have a certain level of wealth, you really start to go from maybe trying to do it yourself to going back to managers and hedge funds and really sophisticated people, both for return and also for efficiency and, and making sure that your money doesn't control you and that um, it's in good hands. So appreciate you sharing that. I know that's um, definitely something that the, the listeners 
look forward to and enjoy hearing. And just in summary, Mr. Conard, what are the long run upsides of inequality? <laughs> Faster growth, <laughs> uh, uh, higher median incomes, uh, greater prosperity for America, both uh, uh, economically and uh, that translates uh, militarily as well. Uh, and I also think that ultimately investment and incentives and uh, successful prudent risk taking create uh, enormous prosperity for uh, the least fortunate people, not only in the United States, but in the entire world. I think that uh, the United States has done more to help uh, the working poor of the world than any economy by a by a, a wide margin. Well said. I love it. It has been a pleasure having you on the show. We really appreciate it. We'll leave links to your books and all of your other material in the show notes. Have yourself a great day in New York City. Thanks for taking time to listen to my point of view. That was a lot of info to digest, and I'm really excited to to talk about this and break it all down. Uh, but before we do that, I want to give a very quick thank you to everyone who's taken the time to share the podcast as well as leave reviews on iTunes and wherever else you listen to the show because you're the reason why we are able to get these big-name bosses on the show. This week, I want to say thank you to Danny Flood, who says, five stars, love this podcast so far. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, but rather – New to investing, I'm really grateful for this podcast as Johnny and Sam are easily relatable and give me a bunch of ideas and tips for where I can put my money to get it working as hard as I do. So big thanks to Danny and everyone else. And Sam, you asked a lot of great questions. We got a lot of information. What do you think? The number one takeaway for me is this is exactly why $20 on a book is the greatest investment you can ever make for that type of money, right? And we've said that before, but you think about it, where else can you get someone's entire life of building wisdom for $20? You know, you just can't, you can't do that for $20. So that's why I think people get older, they write books that recap their career and everything they've learned. And if you can get that for 20 bucks, I mean, you've just, you've just acquired someone's, all of someone's main principles of life and main, you know, knowledge base for 20 bucks. So it's pretty cool. There's a, a lot of information in there. This is definitely one of those episodes, like the Mark Faber episode. I'll go back and listen to two or three times, and just you'll you'll learn something new on each one and take away something new. Yeah, I definitely agree, and I think these, you know, this book, uh, actually both of his books, is something that I want to add to my my audiobook um, kind of queue because. It's a lot of information. You know, it's it's something that's not easy to to digest, but it's kind of like the education that we should have gotten in school that we, for whatever reason, they you know we didn't. And I think as good as it is to read the book, um, having an, an audio uh, is is going to be even better. I mean, I know I know you guys learned a lot from just listening to the interview, but as you can tell, there's so much more information, and I I really believe that. If you guys you know, check out the upside of inequality, how good intentions undermine the middle class uh, on you know, on Audible or wherever you guys get your audiobooks, it's going to be worth it. Yeah, I agree. I just listen to it on audio. I sometimes think it depends on what type of learner you are. I like listening to more like novels and stuff uh, on audiobook. When it comes to business books and there's anything that has statistics or numbers, I find it easier to digest if I'm actually reading it. So it's one thing to consider. Definitely a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics and data in that book. Uh, very good book. And I love the narrative. I mean, look, we're, we're living in a world now. I know, Johnny, you and I kind of grew up, I think, more free market guys. Like, you know, we grew up middle, lower class, had to work hard. I know both our, our parents worked really hard uh, to not make a whole lot. And we're growing up in a world now where it's increasing pressure on this redistribution, redistribution of wealth, kind of warfare against the top 1%. And I think it's really good that, you know, the first book I read on this stuff was Atlas Shrug. Did you ever read that? No. You know, I think that should be on my list as well. It's one of those classics that I don't know why I never got around to. Wow. That's like a, well, you, you need to set some time aside for that. It's a beast. It's like 1600 pages or something. Uh, but that is, that's a, if anywhere you look, that's like a top 10 book to read before you die. This is a great book and it's all about free market. And I think, it's important no matter what your view is on the world or the economy or anything, it's always important to take the other view, right? 
So I think you need to have both views in anything before you can make any type of good decision. You know, you made a good point about us growing up. It was definitely more of a free market world where I feel like this generation or not even not even the, the young generation, but just people living today, we feel more entitled. I think we have so much more than our parents did, you know, when they were our age or, or um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But they never really complained. I never really heard my parents complaining about, you know, wanting more handouts or wanting more entitlement or wanting, you know, uh, even more opportunity. They they went out and they just got, you know, they would just do it and say, if I can do it, if I can make it, I'll make it. If I can't make it, it wasn't meant to be. Mm -hmm. I really feel like this day and age, you know, starting a few years ago, but really now, like everybody thinks that they should they should have more and life should be easier. I agree with that narrative. I th some people may disagree, but that's what I see everywhere. And, and I know a lot of people that are raising children right now say the same thing about their kids. Uh, I don't know what it is. Is it technology? Is it just the culture that we've created in the U.S.? Do we see this as much in other countries? I don't nearly see as much in Asia, but there's also a lot less entitlements in Asia, right? Or at least not in Japan. But or, or There is in Japan, but a lot of places that we hang out, there's not. Um, but coming back to the U S I feel like that is definitely here and might be here to stay unless we can somehow change it. Well, one real easy example is my high school that was two blocks away from my house. I remember, you know, when I was in school, there was no parking lot for, for students. You know, if we had a car and there's only like four people in my whole high school that had a car, we would park on the street and it wasn't a big deal. That's just what it was. Hmm. The parking lot was just for our teachers and staff. And, you know, uh, recently I went to the, walked by my high school and I realized that entire parking lot is full now worth of, of students' cars. Mm. And they're not just, you know, old kind of crappy beaters. They are, you know, BMWs and like just nice cars. Yeah. And I'm sure the kids are complaining there's not enough parking that, you know, there's, um, you know, <laughs> now they want like a parking structure or they just want, they just want more. And every kid expects to have a car now. And a nice car. And it, this is insane because it's not that technology has changed or cars have gotten cheaper. It's just the expectation. I mean, it's not like, you know, phones are a little bit different because we didn't have cell phones uh, in 1999 when we were in high school. But there were cars. And the only difference, you know, is the expectation. Yeah. Well, if you break it down even to a, a younger age, you just mentioned having phones. But when, when we were, let's say we're in elementary school, third, fourth, fifth grade, kids then, even if you're super wealthy, you didn't really have much, right? I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't the gadgets, there wasn't the toys, there wasn't the PlayStation, there wasn't the cell phones, there wasn't the tablets, there wasn't all this, this crazy stuff that we have today. So a rich kid might be a little bit dr nicer dressed in school, but he's standing next to the poor kid and there's not a whole lot difference. Now a third grader goes into school, they got an iPhone 10, right? They got all these things that, especially when you go to their house, they have all these, these things that people never had back then. So I think there's this expectation also as a parents to always be that you can't just have an iPhone six. Now, if you're in middle school, you, you have to have an iPhone 10 or you're going to be seen as like some, like some poor kid. Right. So that's, it's a tough, I don't know how parents handle that. I know that some parents have this this rule of not having allowing their kids to have a phone until they're 10, which I, I sort of like that style. But the problem is, if you do that, you handicap your kid. Like if your kid is 15 years old and doesn't know how to use a tablet, phone, computer, he's significantly got a, a long road ahead. Whereas the, the kid that was playing on a, on a tablet when he was three years old and all through school had one there's a good chance that kid's going to get further ahead. So it's it's hard. People want to maintain their old lifestyle, the lifestyle they knew when they grew up. But if you do that, this is a different world. The kid's not going to have the same advantages as someone else that is, you know, is, that's graduating at the same time as them. Yeah, definitely. And I think another big part of it that he probably outlines in his book, um, at least the theory of it, is the fact that people feel like they should be equal, that everybody should have access to the same thing or deserve the same things. I actually remember the the best class I took in college and university was Dilemmas of Diversity. And it was actually the, the few classes I actually learned anything from. And I just remember we had an exercise where the teacher said, okay, imagine, you know, we all are plane crashes and we're on an island 
is the three of us, mm-hmm. and there's a bunch of stuff. There's like food, wine, tools, you know, clothes. How do you, how do we divide it up? And we just spent the whole class just talking about different ways where we can divide it up. Say, okay, let's let's all share everything. And then the dilemma of that was, okay, well, if we all share everything and someone consumes more, they drink all the wine or they eat all the food. Is that fair? And then someone, you know, someone else said, okay, well, let's um, do an auction or a bidding war, you know. And then the the dilemma of that was the people that were smart would would take the tools and then loan them out to other people mm-hmm. and rent them out uh, for, <laughs> you know, for food or for wine. Uh, and that's a a good that continues to be a service versus a consumable like food or wine. And at the end of the day, we realized not only is there not a clear way for everyone to be perfectly equal, that it's also not fair. I mean, um, and it doesn't need to be fair. That is just like, that is, you know, really just the way life is, is, you know, sometimes you take a gamble. Um, and the, the gamble in that case was, if you took the tools and you thought, you know, really kind of far ahead and long ahead, but you got rescued in five days, the people who took the caviar and the the great wine, they are actually smarter because they consumed it and they enjoyed it. They got rescued, you know, great job. While the people who took the tools really didn't get anything. Mm, very interesting. Well, I guess at the bottom of this is I'm still very much a proponent of free market capitalism. I think economies have to be incentivized. Producers have to be incentivized. And I do believe that that trickles down and benefits everyone as an entire populace in terms of standard of living. But where I still am not sure of is, are we supposed to be chasing GDP? Are we supposed to be chasing standard of living? Are we supposed to be chasing some other metric that we haven't been able to quantify yet, which is more like quality of life or general happiness. And I think if there was, I think soon we'll have enough, uh, you know, between information technologies, big data, and some type of maybe neuroscience, the the combination of all of them mixed in t- together, I think we'll be able to start figuring out what really drives and triggers happiness. And if that comes to, how does that change the world? Do we say, okay, GDP is no longer the most important metrics to chase. Growth is not no longer the most important metrics to chase. Because what? Why are we on Earth? We all just wanted to be happy. We just do things. We start businesses. We chase lovers. We do whatever because we think it's going to bring us more happiness, right? That's only. That's really the biggest driving factor, uh, the biggest indicator in life. We just haven't figured out a way to to quantify it. So once that happens, do we stop drop policies that will help us to grow GDP and grow income and start f- trying to chase policies that will drive more happiness? And I think that's ultimately where we'll get to, but I don't know how long it's going to take. Well, until then, money is still the best scorecard. So uh, this was a great episode. Lots to think about. If you guys want to discuss it more, go ahead and join the Boss Lounge, our private Facebook group. Go to investlikeaboss.com. You can click on uh, this episode, uh, which was episode 93. If you want links to the books, uh, it helps support the show if you buy the books through our links through Amazon or go to investlikeaboss.com slash audio to sign up for a free trial of Audible where you can download his books for free uh, or really any book. And until next week, I really enjoyed uh, this conversation. Sam, thank you so much for being my co-host as well as interviewing these big bosses and asking these great questions. Well, thank you, Johnny. I hope we can catch up this summer in Bulgaria, somewhere on the Med maybe. I'm feeling it after being one month in the U.S. I'm ready to get back on the road. But until then, see you next week. I'll see all you guys in the Boss Lounge. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.